The history of the world is tied with infectious diseases and humanity's attempts at overcoming them. Singapore is no different. Throughout the major events of the past, such as the formation of the Strait Settlements, the Japanese occupation, independence in 1965, and years of nation-building afterwards, Singaporeans have struggled against infectious diseases. Only our pioneers remember the difficulty of those times, the differences before and after the advent of antibiotics and vaccines. What were the infectious diseases afflicting Singapore in the past and post-independence, and how did we control them? Immunization, especially of the children, was a main factor in us eradicating the common childhood diseases. Uh, in addition, of course, foodborne, waterborne diseases were a problem when Singapore became independent in 1965. In fact, um, just before I came here to work in 1965, there was a huge outbreak of typhoid fever where they had hundreds of cases, I don't know how many, about 300, where the medical superintendent had to talk to the medical director, those days they were called medical superintendents, of Tan Tok Seng, and could I borrow one ward just to house my convalescent typhoid patient. That was the setting when I came here. One of the hawkers who was responsible for that typhoid outbreak in 1965, uh, was an itinerant hawker and he sold cold drinks. So you can see his capacity for mischief was <laughs> tremendous. This was the way they could earn a living. This is the only way they could actually uh, do things. And they've been doing it for I don't know how long. And you know, they were itinerant hawkers. They would come to schools uh, at recess and at the end of the day. And that's how they made a living. When I first joined the department, uh, we had outbreaks due to things like salmonella, typhoid, um, pretty big ones and interesting ones. There was some outbreak in uh, IMH. You can imagine how hard to control. But since then, um, I think the last interesting one was the paratyphi uh, outbreak in 1997 or 1996. I can't remember. That was the last interesting one. And in March 1996, there was a sudden increase in the reported cases of paratyphoid fever with no recent travel history. From fewer than one case per week to 10 to 14 cases per week over the subsequent weeks. The infectious diseases that most affected Singaporeans in the past were those associated with poor hygiene and crowding. These included the diseases such as typhoid, tuberculosis, and malaria, as well as the vaccine-preventable diseases of childhood such as smallpox, polio, and measles. I think from a historical perspective, I would say environmental sanitation is very important. That's when you get the you know, clean water supply, refuse disposal, sewage treatment, and the food hygiene. Well, I guess um, with the rehousing, when we got rid of the slums and people moved on to better housing, all the enteric infections definitely fell. Well, we recognise that we cannot continue the night soil bucket system. Uh, from the environmental public health point of view, it will be a disaster. We are building housing board flats. They are all very compact. It will be a very compact, densely populated city and therefore night soil inside the house is just impossible for us from the environmental public health point of view. Therefore, it is simply an imperative that we should get rid of it and lay sewers to every home in Singapore. The whole idea is nights, um, the, the human waste when it is produced must be removed from the house, from the home as soon as we possibly can for the highest standard of environmental public health. So we embark upon a massive program starting from the 1960s to lay sewers throughout the whole of Singapore so that every home will have a sewer and modern med uh, sanitation installed. And we succeeded in the late 1980s when the last noise oil bucket came back to us. The other one would be access to antibiotics. I think uh, that's something that we cannot take for granted. And thirdly, uh, implementation of our immunization program a very systematic coverage of the population 
and also the ability to make sure that every child and uh, the exposed person is also uh, vaccinated. Governmental determination to improve the socio-economic conditions of the people, provide clean water and food, and remove waste efficiently resulted in the decline of most of these diseases. In the next few chapters, we take a look at some of these diseases more closely, including ones that still afflict us today. Tuberculosis is an ancient disease. The germ that causes it spread out of Africa 5,000 years ago via human trade and migration, with approximately 9 million new cases and 1.5 million casualties in 2013. The germ spreads between humans through the air, with rare cases of animal-to-human transmission still occurring today. Well, the numbers of TB, not only pulmonary, but bones, joints and meningitis, were huge during the Second World War years and in the 50s. Well, very simply, if you want to tackle any enemy, you have to know the enemy. And this enemy is one which infects the lungs. And because it infects the lungs, and the response of the patient is to cough. Major events in tuberculosis control include the introduction of the BCG vaccination in 1957, which improved child mortality rates, and the introduction of effective anti-tuberculosis drugs after well-conducted research trials from the 1950s. Singapore's efforts comprises of surveillance, treatment, prevention, health education, and research. With improved general socio-economic status and hygienic conditions, tuberculosis and death rates fell drastically. Nonetheless, there are still new cases of tuberculosis diagnosed every year. Now, the chance of developing disease after getting infected is not very high, but high enough to cause a problem for society. The rate of progression to active TB disease after being infected may be in the region of about 10% in an immune-competent person during some time in his life. Now, TB is a very slow tempo disease. It's not like a flu or some viral disease where if you get infected, you will know within a few days if someone has given you the flu or measles or mumps or whatever it is. Well, for a start, they started a TB registry in 1957 and they had a specific national TB program, which was uh, also started in 1957 in the TB control unit, which was responsible for administering the national program. My father, Dr. Benjamin Chu, who was senior physician, with Dr. Clarence Smith here, requested Gold Tree Club to donate a building. And they did. And this was the Rotary Clinic. Also at their behest, they requested the foundation of a voluntary organization to combat tuberculosis. And this was SATA. And these were the two centers that battled tuberculosis during the early post-war years. So they had a dedicated unit which dealt with just TB and I think that was a very, very good thing. And this thing is still happening today. Many of the patients who had TB uh, came from very low socioeconomic groups uh, with financial problems and requiring assistance and welfare and so on. And I think they contributed a lot in that area. The government also introduced BCG vaccination, which was very effective actually for the infants, newborn and children. Streptomycin came to us just after the war in 1946 and 1947 with INH in 1951. In the case of diabetes, hypertension and other diseases which affect the patient only, no one else suffers if the patient is not compliant. You get your leg amputated, you get a heart attack, high blood pressure, you get a bleed in the brain, it's your own funeral in a way. But in TB, you make other people suffer with you. If you do not take your medicines properly, your TB disease is not properly handled, you continue to be a threat to the community. So it cannot be left to the patient to decide whether he's going to be adherent to the treatment or not. Society must be interested in making sure that the patient is taking the medicine so that society is safe. And therein comes the program of DOT. DOT is called Directly Observed Treatment. The pills that a patient is supposed to take are taken in the presence of a responsible healthcare worker to see that every dose throughout the entire course of six months or nine months or whatever are actually taken. So the patient doesn't hold the medicines themselves. They go to meet the healthcare worker or they go to a clinic 
and they take the pills. And the moment they miss the pills, the healthcare worker knows and calls him, reminds him, recalls him and so on. We are a little worried, especially with regard to migrant workers, because they have come from incidents of higher rates of tuberculosis. So we have to remain vigilant when we have migrant workers. They have to be pre-screened, they have to be checked. Some still get through the net, and that may explain why our rates of tuberculosis is still there. It has not come down to zero levels, which we want to, but we, I think we have to remain vigilant. Then, of course, this is compounded by AIDS. Our first AIDS patient was in the mid-80s, and from them we have had a quite a good number of AIDS, and a number of them are down with tuberculosis, and they very often they are non-compliant. Normally, uh, when you start the medicine, you will just have less and less medicine, but then now it's like I have more and more, and so it is kind of like um, a shock. Lah. For all that trouble, uh, the patient is suffering from the drug side effects and so on, and uh, if drug multi-drug resistant TB should ever become the predominant TB, then I would say that uh, it would be almost impossible with our current strategies to control TB. Ever. My parents and my family also, they were worried that um, seeing me taking more and more medicines and um, instead of becoming better, I was becoming, uh, it's, it's not that I was becoming worse, but I had to take more and more. And the medicines were actually like stronger and had more side effects, so. Well, the long duration of treatment is not easy for patients to comply. Eh? But nevertheless, our nurses and our contact staff did very well. Despite the successes of the 1970s to 1990s, progress against tuberculosis in Singapore has slowed, with rising tuberculosis cases since 2008 and increasing numbers of patients with multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis. The former is due to changes in the population demographic including an ageing population and an influx of foreigners living and working in Singapore over the years. The latter represents the global trend of increasing drug resistance in the tuberculosis germ. It is more difficult to deal with infectious diseases that are able to adapt and evolve with humans. More hard work, collective will and innovation is required to eliminate tuberculosis from Singapore's shores. With uh, Singapore's social economic uh, development and, uh, and high standards now in, in sanitation and hygiene, um, I think one of the major achievements um, and milestones for Singapore has been the rapid decline in food and waterborne diseases. Um, diseases such as cholera, um, typhoid fever, enteric fevers like typhoid, paratyphoid, hepatitis A, we hardly ever see any of those. If we do see, then they're usually imported. Through vaccinations, through the school health services that, that uh, Singapore uh, uh, had, um, that infectious diseases were very much uh, uh, in control. Okay? And uh, newer vaccinations were introduced, including things like uh, hepatitis B for a chronic disease, right? like uh, you know, the, uh, liver cancer. Vaccines are remarkable tools against certain infectious diseases. They can provoke a lasting immune response, a safeguard against that particular disease. Singapore is at the forefront of introducing new vaccines for immunisation, although the reasons for each vary. In this segment, we will focus on two vaccines, the hepatitis B vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine, and how these were introduced into Singapore's childhood immunisation schedule. We are a uh, WHO country, you know. Um, other countries like Taiwan, Taiwan is not in WHO. America was too vast, but they had a lot of uh, their human rights, so they had great trouble in starting. Uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong um, did not have a national uh, registry. So many, even Japan, did not have a national cancer registry. Only Singapore had a national registry. So these are the reasons why WHO chose Singapore. We had the infrastructure, we had the people, we had the logistics to monitor. 
monitor not just for two or three years, practically for life. When the pneumococcal vaccine for children became available in the year 2000, the Ministry of Health did not include it in our childhood immunization schedule at first because of its high cost and questions about its effectiveness in the local setting. However, it was proven to be cost-effective by determined local clinician researchers. Since 2012, pneumococcal vaccination has been made optional in the childhood immunization schedule. So pneumococcal vaccination had already been practiced uh, and adopted nationally in different countries, for example, the USA, the UK and Australia. So we had published uh, our lo lo own local study from the year to 1997 to 2004 and we found that our local incidence of invasive pneumococcal disease was roughly about 14 per 100,000 cases. Um, and so we also showed that the first generation of pneumococcal conjugate vaccine could actually prevent 78% of the invasive diseases and 84% of the strain related uh, vaccine-related strains. Um, so thereafter, the pneumococcal vaccine became incorporated in the national program from the year 2009. But in the year 2010, the coverage using the first generation had actually dropped to about 64%. So in the year 2011, we used the second generation of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. In the 1970s, Singapore conducted hepatitis B vaccine trials and included it into the childhood immunization schedule when it proved effective. To lower the costs of purchasing it, Singapore successfully bid for the vaccine manufacturing plant to be set up here. Looking back over the last 30 years, this is one of the greatest achievements by Singapore. The success of the vaccination program it's one of our greatest, I would say, greatest contribution to the world in terms of prevention of, uh, of a very dangerous infection, as well as a prevention of a major cancer in the world, liver cancer. Hepatitis B is a, uh, still a big problem in, in Asia and, and in Singapore, and, uh, and Singapore introduced hepatitis B vaccine in 1987. And now we also see a massive decline in, the, in, in hepatitis B infections in that age group. We were able to introduce it into the existing vaccination of childhood. No one at that time know how to do it. They had done pilot studies, like we have done pilot studies. We have vaccinated children to see whether it's safe or effective. Our next, next thing is you really introduce into the existing immunization program where Within the whole country, you have to get everybody coordinated <laughs> doing the same thing, knowing when to do and what. And also to find out whether your BCG, your triple, your dipure tetanus uh, whooping cough will effect will be diminished by the vaccine or increased or more side effects of it. No one knows also, no? But we dare to go ahead and do it and watch and monitor. And but um, by the grace of God, we had no disasters for 25 years. Singapore has been remarkably progressive over the years in being an early adopter of the various vaccines. And some credit for this must surely go to local doctors and public health officials who have done the hard work and crunched the data to show that these vaccines will actually help protect the public. Since 1819, Singapore has been a major transport and travel hub for the world. Although such interconnectedness has been a boon for the economy and our own access to foreign goods and ideas, it has also made us vulnerable to infectious disease epidemics across the world. All the major influenza pandemics of the past have also affected the people of Singapore. In fact, Professor Lim Kok Ahn of NUS did us proud in being the first to identify the novel influenza virus that caused the Asian flu pandemic of 1959. Though HIV, tuberculosis and dengue are not as well known as the SARS outbreak and the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, they are still epidemics in Singapore. So for SARS, you know, we, we use established public health methods to uh, detect cases early, isolate them, carry out contact tracing. I think for dengue and chikungunya, both are vector-borne conditions. So first of all, I would say that it is not solely a medical issue. 
it is a multi-sectorial issue that we need to work together with uh, colleagues from other fields. We've also had this task force since 2003 and we've never stopped working since then. We've been meeting regularly, quarterly, you know, to review our plans, to practice, exercise and making sure how we can be better each time. Epidemics can either be rapidly spreading or slow. The latter are often insidious and are not easily recognised or contained because the time frame of their spread results in their not being in the public consciousness. I remember that uh, we were at the infectious disease round, which is held weekly on Fridays, and we were reviewing a patient that had a severe uh, community-acquired atypical pneumonia. And I think this uh, incident actually kick-started a lot of the SARS research. Scientists were able to isolate the virus and they eventually released the whole genome sequence of this virus. And I think uh, that, that opened the way for a lot of the subsequent work on SARS. Many people in Singapore still remember the SARS outbreak in 2003 and perhaps the influenza H1N1 pandemic in 2009. Tuberculosis, dengue and HIV are epidemics that have become endemic in Singapore precisely because they have been relatively difficult to contain, albeit for different reasons. Singapore has got a pretty comprehensive um, dengue control program. And uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, we had then Environment Ministry put in place a very comprehensive vector control program. Singapore has done very well in bringing down the vector population. Really, the credit goes to the community. Uh, of course, NEA with, does a lot of campaigning and uh, providing evidence and knowledge, but the activity has to be done by the community. The clinical management of HIV is drastically different. I mean, HIV in Singapore is no longer, anywhere in the world, is no longer a, a life sentence. Um, and that has been the result of drug development that's occurred primarily in North America, but also in other parts of the world, in Europe and in Japan. Regarding social attitudes, we have done national surveys um, and which have shown slight improvements in, in understanding and acceptance and uh, therefore less discriminatory attitudes and stigmatization. But I think it's still pervasive. I, I think that, that uh, it's a, we have a long, long way to go. In terms of uh, coming to find new jobs, uh, I would say that I'm always checking out with um, Evin whether have you come across cases whereby there's discrimination because I really scared I'll be discriminated. All the diseases mentioned above, except for tuberculosis, are caused by viruses. H1N1 is an influenza virus and pandemics arise when influenza viruses of humans and animals, such as birds and pigs, merge or reassort, forming novel influenza viruses that we lack immunity against. SARS and MERS are caused by coronaviruses that likely originated from bats and were subsequently transmitted to humans. These are examples of zoonotic diseases, the term meaning infectious diseases that spread from animals to humans. In 2005, we had cases of avian influenza from Indonesia and that's when all our labs also started to get themselves prepared for a pandemic with exercises, we set up PCR tests for influenza. The HIV virus is different from the other viruses listed above in that it spreads via sexual intercourse or contaminated blood products and the disease often takes years to manifest. What are our lessons and experiences from these modern epidemics? I think it would be very useful to um, set aside funds specifically for infectious disease or microbiology research because um, when there's no outbreak happening, people tend to forget how important infectious diseases are. The lesson for that is that we must make sure that all countries have good public health so that they can detect and respond to infectious disease outbreaks when and where they occur. You know, we'll never know when's the next outbreak, so this is where it makes sense for the infection prevention control program to be robust, you know, to be updated what's going on and to have an ongoing kind of a program of vigilance and readiness. Singapore has been remarkably successful against many modern epidemics. Singapore's small size, good healthcare system, public health surveillance and outbreak response system are all important factors. However, we are less successful against dengue and HIV. Continued public education to reduce the stigma of HIV and support for the continued medical treatment remains important. Concerted attempts have not altered the endemic and outbreak cycles of dengue, but other approaches, such as Wolbachia-infected male mosquitoes 
and dengue vaccines are being considered. Despite Singapore's successes with infectious diseases in her past and present, the threat is never far. I think the biggest threat facing Singapore would be that we let our guard down. The rise in antimicrobial uh, resistance. The, the risk of uh, foodborne diseases could be higher. But MERS is the current threat. Future threats are also those that are not known. A lot of the recent outbreaks have actually been linked to animals. What are the possible infectious diseases that might threaten Singapore in the future? We are at the crossroad of international travel. With all this globalisation. Any infection can uh, easily come to Singapore. We need to find ways of uh, identifying and typing bacteria more rapidly. We're seeing an increased burden in, in these kind of resistant organisms from MRSA to VRE and now the very resistant uh, gram-negative organisms. It can be very devastating. Uh, it will always be the, the curveball. Though viruses will continue to proliferate in the world and bacterial evolution will erode the effectiveness of antibiotics, we can still view the future with hope. Singapore is quite remarkable. We have such a tremendous um, uh, potential in Singapore. And restructured hospitals and all have very good infection control teams. The highest hope I have is for a vaccine. Some of these efforts include surveillance and containment of outbreaks, continued building of clinical infrastructure, and support of research into infectious diseases. We should adopt a flexible risk management approach. We should continue to invest in our people to reinstate ID control. Isolation, containment. A great uh, surveillance uh, system. Working together, close knitedly. Reach out to people who need help. Public education and communication to reduce the stigma of infectious diseases such as tuberculosis and HIV will play an important role in the future. If we have, you know, 10% resource or effort. We will be better prepared to handle future outbreaks. Capable of reacting to such sudden threats. Help our colleagues and everyone to be ready. We can really make a contribution, not just to Singapore, but to the rest of the world. I'm fairly confident that we have done well for SG50. And I'm sure we'll go forth to SG100 in confidence. Singapore's activities in the past that controlled the spread of infectious diseases remain a good template for building on previous achievements and ensuring another secure 50 years.